This is Kanzen Shu, the podcast, episode 501, for the week of May 21st, 2023. Welcome back to Kanzenshu, the podcast, an extension of the all-encompassing Dragon Ball fan site, Kanzenshu. We cover anything and everything Dragon Ball in hopes of enlightening and a little bit of entertaining. Hey, welcome back, everyone. It's been a hot minute since episode 500, which uh, notably broke me over the last month or so. Uh, who is me? Hi, my name is Mike. You may see me around as Vegito EX. It was a massive undertaking to put that together. That's a bit of an understatement. Uh, I had a wonderful time putting it together, and we got so many awesome comments. Longtime listeners, new listeners alike. It was great. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Onward from here, on to episode 501. And 501 is already recorded. The topic's already in the bag, so I want to get into it as soon as possible. So let me set you up here. It's May 2023 at the moment. That is two months removed from March 2023, which is when I originally wanted to do this, but episode 500, it was a whole thing. But here we are. Uh, what was big in March? That was the 10-year anniversary of the theatrical film Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods. And I thought, hey, let's watch that movie again and talk about it. Ah, but I want to come to it from a different angle. What would that angle be? You're going to hear all about that special different angle in the topic. And that's what you're about to listen to. The The conversation you'll hear is with myself, uh, occasional returning guest, AJ. You certainly know AJ here. Uh, new time voice on the podcast for the first time, Tyson. I had a wonderful time talking with everyone. Both have been invaluable resources, whether they know it, believe it or not, over the last several years. Uh, some of the work that they have done, contributed, and continue to do as we bounce questions and work on projects. So please enjoy this conversation looking back at Battle of Gods, and I will catch you on the other side to wrap up the show and look ahead to the future a little bit. So here we go. So joining me to talk about Battle of Gods from 10 years ago. Yes, uh, Battle of Gods is 10 years old. Returning to the show, I believe the last time you were here was almost exactly a year ago, AJ, and we were looking ahead to you know, the future of the anime and the manga, and God, we didn't know what we were really in for at that point, but welcome back to talk about, I hate to say it, old stuff now. Yeah, it makes me feel very old. I turned 30 yesterday, and hearing that Battle of Gods is now 10 years old just doesn't help going through a crisis. That's killing me that you were 20 when Battle of Gods came out. It's weird to think about. Yeah, I was just, I wasn't even at university yet. I think, oh, no, no, I think I just, yeah, I just started. <laughs> All right, goddamn kids. Well, and then joining us for the first time on the show, which this, I gotta say, this is really weird for me because... We've been mostly been playing video games together weekly for, I can't even remember at this point. So I'm getting a very different Tyson here on the podcast as opposed to what I'm used to every Saturday night. But welcome <laughs> to the show. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think it occurred to me, I, I have like the tangential Mark crew here with me, don't I? Yeah, you do. Yeah, you uh, contracted the... an entire troop. <laughs> Being overwhelmed. That's okay. Uh we are indeed talking about Battle of Gods. Uh, it's been 10 years since this movie came out in Japanese theaters. It has left a lasting impact on the Dragon Ball franchise, and it has been revisited several times since its original theatrical version. Um, we're going to talk through Battle of Gods, I'm hoping from a different perspective here, 10 years out. Now, we've reviewed Battle of Gods a couple times on the show. We did it from its original Japanese theatrical release, which Julian saw on release day in Japan. Uh, I want to say that we reviewed the dub of the film. I'm pretty sure we did that. Uh, we reviewed the the extended Fuji TV version of the film with the 20-ish minutes of extra material. That got a home video release everywhere as well. Um, we've even reviewed the original four-chapter manga adaptation when that was new, and then we skipped the rest of the manga and then picked up with the new stuff. More on that in a little bit. So what is there to talk about with Battle of Gods here now in 2023, 10 years later from its original release? I'm going to get to that. Before we do that, though, I kind of want to do a quick review of what Battle of Gods is, because I feel like we've been so far removed from it, and especially because the Dragon Ball Super TV series adaptation kind of supplanted, I, I think for a lot of folks, this version of the story. Uh, it's kind of wild wild to go back to what this film originally was. So Battle of Gods, 
Theaters, Japan, March 2013. First new theatrical film. I think it was in 17 years. And by that, I mean truly theatrical the way we think of it these days, as opposed to lumped in with the Toei Anime Fair style of premieres back then, where it'd be like a double feature, triple feature, a bunch of other Toei material. This is a full-length theatrical film. Like, that's the thing you go to see. That's the only thing you see. Now, Battle of Gods was originally in the works at Toei, independent of Toriyama, with a script by Yusuke Watanabe and character designs by Tadayoshi Yamamura. That last name there, you definitely know and we'll talk more about a lot on this here episode. Now, at the suggestion of Kazuhiko Torishima, Dr. Mashirito himself, Toriyama took a look at what was going on and became heavily involved. He basically wrote, rewrote the entire script, changed up a lot of the scenario and even the character, their designs, their motivations, everything there. In the end, we still had Yamamura with animation duties there. Um, we had a new musical composer for the franchise in the form of Norihito Sumitomo, which again, we will talk more about on this episode. We all know kind of how it went from here. It spawned a sequel film, I guess you could say, in 2015. That was Resurrection F. And immediately after that, we went in into the Dragon Ball Super TV series and the manga, which retold these films and then carried on into new material. Now, before we kind of get into where we came into Battle of Gods 10 years ago, I do want to read this little snippet from the original press release that Toei put out back in July 2012. A new story in the official history of Dragon Ball is born. Neither a spin-off nor a side story, one that can be enjoyed by both children and parents, manga fans and anime fans. That comment has gotten a lot of mileage <laughs> in the 10 years since then. Um, but we've had three versions of this story now. We have the original film and its extended edition, which I mentioned. The four-chapter rushed manga adaptation, incomplete manga adaptation. And then the TV series re-adaptation in Dragon Ball Super. So now it being 10 years later, I thought it would be a great time to reassess things. I've been talking a little bit here. I want to turn it over to you guys uh, and tell me a little bit about where you were were 10 years ago in your Dragon Ball fandom and how you approach this film. Tyson, as the new kid on the block here on this podcast, where were you 10 years ago? It's so <clears throat> it's so crazy to think about the fact that this is 10 years ago because myself and I think pretty much everybody was just in such a different space as far as Dragon Ball fandom goes compared to now. Obviously, things have changed so much. Uh, me personally, I mean, I was still, God, I don't know. I was like three years old bursting out of the womb practically. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's, it's the way that America was at the time. We liked Dragon Ball. We liked Dragon Ball Z. Kai was a thing that was kicking around for some of the young kids and all that jazz. But the, just the general knowledge of what was happening behind the scenes and anything other than like surface entertainment was just not what was happening in any of my circles and it's it's fascinating to look back and see how quickly that changed with this movie and it kind of probing people's curiosity as to how something like this gets created how how long had you been into dragon ball at this point in 2013 well i don't want to i don't want to date myself here but <laughs> uh, since i can remember things <laughs> okay I, I remember <laughs> discovering dragon ball New Year's Day, like the the ball had just dropped, and me and my dad were like channel surfing on cable TV, and we stumbled upon the upon the like uh, the Majin Vegeta sacrifice episode, and it captured our imaginations. And ever since, I had been watching it since I can remember. <sighs> Goddamn kids! All right, AJ, you <laughs> tell me where you were. 2013. I remember this is like when you joined the forum. Yeah, so I. I had joined the forum a couple months before Battle of Gods came out. My Dragon Ball experience uh, started a tiny bit before then. I mean, I had obviously grown up with Dragon Ball in the UK. It started in like 2001, and I think I watched it for several years, maybe up to in like maybe 2005 or so. So I wasn't like super far removed from that initial discovery here in this country. Um, but I'd kind of taken a little break and I'd been watching quote unquote adult anime like Death Note and Elven Lead and, you know, the edgy shit that, that oh teenagers love. So <laughs> so basically uh, towards the end of 2012, I guess I was in like a, a silly, goofy mood and was like, let's rediscover old stuff. And I had um, thrown on the old ocean thing and I was like, I'm not really feeling this. My friend had been like, well, why don't you try Kai and I'd watched um, Kai the Kai dub and be like, okay, yeah, that was that was pretty cool. There was no Bukai at the time, of course, so I ended up watching that in uh, Japanese and reading it, and then that was like my gateway into 
madness because I then discovered the Kanzenshi forums. And at that point, it's like, Jesus Christ, there's a whole level of fandom I didn't even fathom. <laughs> um, so I fell down that rabbit hole. And now 10 years later, it's become a sort of career, really. Uh, so yeah. thanks for that. Um, yeah, you're welcome. I do that a lot, it sounds like. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I was just, I was just really hyped for it. To me, it was kind of, it was like a momentum thing. Like I'd gotten back into it. I'd gone through all the material and suddenly, oh my God, there's a revival film. What? And so, yeah, like I, I just, I remember it coming out in theaters in Japan. And at the time, God bless my new heart. I was avoiding spoilers. I stayed completely spoiler free uh, up until that film uh, came out uh, on home release, Japanese home release. And I remember sitting down and I watched it raw uh, and just had my mind blown. Um, yeah, very, very different uh, approach to nowadays where I'm like, I must know everything immediately now. <laughs> you know, where's the camera? Like, I just, uh, you know, th that desperation. It's wild to think that actually the social media landscape 10 years ago, you could, as you proved, like you could actually do that. You could be spoiler free to some degree. Yeah. And make it to the film's release. And that's impossible now because Toei themselves are like, hey, 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 you want to see Orange Piccolo? You want to see him? You want to see him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I kind of miss that. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's good. So um, I am the requisite old person. Kanzenshu uh, actually launched a year prior to Battle of Gods coming out. Obviously, I have been doing my site since 1998, uh, but... 2012 was when Constantine and Daisenshu EX merged into Constantine. So it was a perfect time because we we doubled our staff at that point. So there were four of us running the website. Uh, and it was also a great time because Julian was in Japan and covered literally every aspect of this film's production and release. I mean, every magazine, every translation, everything we know about the film in Dragon Ball fandom is literally on the shoulders of Julian himself, that single person. So thank you to Julian who did all of that stuff 10 years ago. Um, obviously, I had been in the Dragon Ball game for a long time at that point. I was looking forward to a, I guess, quote unquote, new thing. We had the Jump Super Anime Tour special uh, a few years prior in 2008. Uh, I had no real expectation of what might come from this film, though. I don't think anyone really did. So now I kind of want to take it to the, the present day. I'm actually unsure of how long it's been since I've watched this movie. I thought we did a five year look back at the movie on the podcast because we did one for the 2008 special. But but then I looked and we didn't. So that said, I think the last time I sat and watched the complete version of this movie was in 2014 with the extended edition of the film. Um, I watched wow. it last night and it was it was a really weird and fun experience. I definitely haven't watched it in a number of years because it was I don't want to say it was like watching it brand new for the first time, but it was pretty close to it, which is wild considering what I do. Um, <laughs> that was my reapproach to the movie. When's the last time y'all watched Battle of Gods? That's really interesting. I So I rewatched it uh, two months ago now, like just like right around the time that it was like bang on 10 years. And then yeah. prior to that, I watched it a lot. I've seen that film so many times at this point um, to the point where like it's, it's very hard for me to to look at it through anything other than like a hypercritical lens because I've just seen it so many times. Yeah, I definitely did 10 years ago, but it had been a hot minute. Uh, Tyson, how about you? I'm in a much closer situation to you. I think probably the last time I proper sat down and watched it front to back must have been within somewhere around when Super started airing. So not long after the movie actually released. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I you know, I had, I had worked with footage for it and done projects with Battle Gods and all this over the course of the last few years, but it's completely different actually sitting down and watching it yeah. and just seeing this in its original form rather than, you know, the anime readaptation. It's, it's almost surreal time capsule element of what this product is. And, you know, I watched the theatrical edition rather than the extended one this time. Yep. Uh, I thought I remembered the differences well enough, but then by the time I was done, I was like, man, the only thing I remember being different was the rock, paper, scissors with Oolong. What, what even was the extra stuff? Like, Oh, Goku says the thing about fusion. I think that, like that's, but what else was it? And I, I can't remember. I'm, I'm losing my touch here. Ex exact same situation. I watched the uh, extended edition for this rewatch. Yeah. And I kept waiting for bits that I knew were additional. And the only thing that came up for me was the rock, paper, scissors. The rest I was like, was this not originally in the movie? Am I going insane? Yeah, yeah it's wild. So for me, I, I almost always do the extended version. 
and, it's better by far. And like, it's weird. So you you bring up the rock paper scissors bit. When I watch the theatrical version, the thing that I always miss is not that, but it's the bit slightly after that where they all go, oh, Vegeta's a good guy now, and they applaud. Like I don't know why, but that joke always kills oh, me. I, I really miss <laughs> that it's uh, I really miss that it's not in the theatrical version. Oh, really good. <laughs> all right. Well, that kind of takes us to. Hey, you're talking about Battle of Gods. It's been 10 years. Like, what's the point? You can say these little things and, you know, what your experience is about. Why is that different? Here's the angle I'm going for. And it, it's a little bit selfish. It's a little bit personal here. Um, it's coming from my experience over the last few years going through the entire One Piece TV series. Now, I'm... I'm a pretty old One Piece fan. I got into it when it started, but I've always had these spurts of I watch or read a lot and catch up and then I lose it and then I try to start over. I try to catch up. I never quite make it. I never get beyond Skypea. I drop it again. I try starting like, oh, I was reading it last time. Now I'm going to watch it. Finally, last couple of years, it took, it held. And Mary and I have been watching the entire series. We're like two episodes away from whole cake being over so like i'm excited for the reverie stuff and then like we're we're off to wano and i'm i'm just psyched to see it Oof, yeah you got some fun stuff ahead i do and we're going to talk all about these these little all of that is relevant to this conversation what's also relevant to our watching the tv series is watching the films that were contemporary with the release of the tv series so that includes strong world and most specifically relevant to battle of gods is film z now one piece film z i believe released in december 2012 that's like three four months before Battle of Gods hit Japanese theaters. And I remember when we sat down and watched Film Z, I'm like, wow, this looks really good. This is beautiful. Oh, I can't believe it. And then I looked at the dates and I'm like, motherfucker, this is what you want. <laughs> You're kidding me. And, yeah. So AJ, we've, <laughs> on this podcast, we've talked about this before. Um, there's this fandom conversation, controversy, a lot of stuff being levied at different people about One Piece, quote unquote, stealing talent from whether it's <laughs> Dragon Ball or another franchise, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, This might be a little bit of a rehash, and I I feel bad on them. I'm like even indulging it a little more than it's probably worth. But that was my real reaction <laughs> to watching Film Z. <laughs> And then so coming back over to Dragon Ball and One Piece at the same time with fresh eyes and watching it that way, it, it really just was absolutely baffling to me to see yeah. that. Um, so I, I kind of want to get into what I saw in Film Z. Now, I don't remember a lot about the story. I remember there's been a few movies where there's like an old person from the old pirate days. I think Film Z was that. I just rewatched Stampede. That was another one, guy from Roger's crew. Yep. I think one of the older films this was actually another like old school pirate. So they they bleed in my head a little bit here. So I've only watched them all once, except for Stampede, which I saw in theaters and then just rewatched again. So I know that one pretty well. But what got me about watching this film was like the line work, some of the exaggerated animation. Um, and then in comparison with Battle of Gods, which again, I just rewatched last night. One Piece is really guilty of this lately too, but like the giant CG monsters, like that was the end of Stampede. It was a giant CG monster that looked like a PS3 cutscene. <laughs> but... The, the amount of like screen shaking and blurring there was in Battle of Gods, I'm like, oh, they're hiding. They're, they're completely hiding the work they've done on this. And I couldn't believe how much I came away from rewatching Battle of Gods last night going, yeah, that was just a long TV episode. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Like Film Z is a film. It's a movie. It is cinematic. And... As much as it pains me to say it, yeah, Battle of Gods is a, a middling TV series episode, if that. There are some nice highlights, but for the most part, there's nothing in there that's not completely TV level, um, which is a shame. Uh, on the subject of, you know, One Piece stealing Dragon Ball stuff, um, the, there's slightly more validity to it in this case, <laughs> but maybe not from the same sort of cynical, angry Dragon Ball fan you know, approach. Uh, it doesn't really hold water when it comes to the later stuff. But in terms of this, I think like in, in our Dragon Ball bubble, it's very easy to look back at Battle of Gods and think, well, this was the revival of the franchise with Toriyama at the helm. Why yeah. is this not huge? But they, I was talking about this with Mary last night too. Like they got a grant to work on this for like the worldwide yeah. popularity of it. Yeah. There, there, there's so much on paper that you would think like, man, that why would this not be massive? But I think 
when you look at the surrounding stuff, like this is a film that came after Kai flopped and we got a random Bardock OVA, you know, like, yeah. mm-hmm. I think, I think had Toriyama not stepped in, you know, we know this would have just been another kind of whatever sort of glorified special in disguise sort of thing. Um, when you look at One Piece, at the time, that thing was at its peak. I mean, it was off the back of the anime wrapping up its climax of the first arc. Um, you know, Oda had finally jumped in with involvement in the movies with Strong World, and then there was mm-hmm. Film Z. And Film Z was the, the first film post time skip. The anime had barely even touched on this period at the moment. So, yeah, I remember that. Like, that was the debut for a lot of like those versions of the characters. We actually, saw yeah, the it was. For- it was really big. Film Z, I think in many ways, it was it was just capitalizing on this absolute cultural zeitgeist that One Piece was at the time. And, mm-hmm. you know, you had you had Oda, you know, doing partnerships with Amani for their outfits in the film. Yeah, like yeah, yeah. Av- Avril Lavigne did two themes for it. Like it was it was so big. And you think about it, it's kind of that the biggest thing ever right now versus the resurrection of what was a relatively sort of dead franchise. I mean, we say dead, we there's video games and stuff, but in terms of a big major anime, Dragon Ball wasn't really a thing. This was like the depths of its video game sales too. Like I, for folks that weren't around at the time, like those, the games were tanking year over year over year. And this was like the bottom of the barrel we had for games. So like it was in a bad place. And you talked about Kai flopping and we've talked about this countless times on the podcast, but, and we're experiencing a little bit of it right now again is when the show is not on tv merchandise sales are better <laughs> <laughs> yeah dragon ball works in very strange ways but yeah like it it's really odd um and i think like the thing is if we if we put aside the the, the one piece side of things i think when you look at the staff the the battle of gods was given it yeah. all feels very strange to me and I think that really kicks off with the director choice, Masahiro Hosoda. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, that's always been like being a really strange decision. He's someone who, he did five episodes on the original series and only one of them is memorable, which was um, Goku's self-sacrifice. Like the rest of them were all really low priority. You know, we've handed this off to Uchiyama or Hakamada. Like none of them were particularly noteworthy. And I think when you put aside even that, Hosoda's just not a particularly excellent director he's just kind of nothing his episodes his one piece episodes he was the kind of guy who would just get given whatever kind of stuff like it's it's okay it sometimes has some okay moments but usually if it's really good it's just incidental maybe he had a decent staff member on board or whatever and battle of gods was his second feature length movie ever ever like the mm-hmm. first film that he ever did was in 2001 called the siamese and uh almost nobody has seen it and when i dug up reviews from people who had seen it, it had an average of four out of ten so i don't think you know he's he's really done all all that much um and i always found that really strange and let's pause there let's talk about so we have that's the director for battle of god that's who we get there yes over on one piece a name that we're familiar with now for sure from dragon ball absolutely tatsuya nagamine yes director of dragon ball super broly and the guy who i guess in many ways restarted the heart of dragon ball super when the yeah. when the uh, universe survival arc started it was um, um co-directed with i'm blanking on the other name at that ryota point. nakamura yeah That's it. and i i think nagamine is a really important name to, to bring up because he is such a different type of director to Hosoda. Nagamine is, I would say, is an auteur in pretty much every sense of the word. Like he's he's so talented, and everything will fit his vision. Um, like I, when it comes to Film Z, uh, he quite famously worked with Oda on writing the the antagonist of the film Zephyr. They wanted him to be really sympathetic and. You know, it got to a point where Nagamine is so driven in his focus that he actually really annoyed Oda at one point because <laughs> Oda was like, oh, can we can we throw some like comedic elements in with Zephyr, like having him like fold his clothes in a funny way? And Nagamine's like, no, no, we're not doing that because that completely flies in the face of the tone that I want for this film. We're not doing that. And there was some friction there, but like, that's the kind of director that Nagamine is. And he has such a, an intense history, you know, throughout the, the industry. He has so many contacts and you look at that staff list and it's like, man, you've got all of the top One Piece stuff, all of these top freelancers from the industry, and then a hell of a lot of animators that are really good, but also really good friends with Nagamine. Like, it's just the Mm. perfect storm of everything that us Dragon Ball fans didn't get to experience until he did Broly. Like, it's just a complete 
complete opposite to, to what Hosoda uh, and Yamamura were doing with, with Battle of Gods. It's why I feel like there's so much I want to talk about with the the animation and, and the staff there. So I guess let's indulge that just a little bit. And I, I want to talk about the music side for sure. Um, but sticking with it and just thinking about my recent rewatch of Battle of Gods, I can't help but compare Battle of Gods to even just like the Tournament of Power and where the TV series went and feeling like Tournament of Power had better showcases of straight up animation than Battle of Gods yeah. did. Um, 100%. There, there's so much just like rotating backgrounds and CG and we talked about the blurring and all that kind of stuff. It's it's just wild to compare them. So let's talk about the animation over on Battle of Gods and it's, as I kind of hinted at in the tweet I put out yesterday, we didn't quite know it, but this was the beginning of the end for Tadayoshi Yamamuro. Uh, he got one more chance and that was it. Then he got shoved in the corner and got told to do a promo web anime after this. <laughs> um, but and again, we've talked about Yamamoro so much over the years on this show, whether it's, you know, a profile and just talking about the work he's done. But I mean, he's a stalwart of the Dragon Ball franchise, like incredible work and was an exciting name to see announced alongside this film. Like, oh, cool. It's, you know, the animation director from the end of the series. Great. And it's wonderful. And we got Toriyama on board as well. It, like it on paper sounded perfect like yeah the gang's back together on this film uh i don't know how much we want to rehash things like the character designs and like and when i talk about character designs i don't mean you know super sign god has red hair as opposed to you know bulky with a cape um i could not believe and i, I remember this from last time i watched it but i was just absolutely in awe the scene in battle of gods where goku arrives he's already been on earth you don't realize this until the end of the film where he says he was watching Vegeta, but like when he kind of like covers down and walks back in and the way that he so stiffly walks <laughs> with his shoulders, <laughs> it, it was unbelievable to see as a theatrical film version like that, that drawing moving on the screen was shocking to me. Yeah. I, it's funny. So, <laughs> We obviously have spoken a lot about how, you know, Yamamura has gone downhill and, you know, it's kind of old hat to, to bash him or whatever. And I think yeah. you're right, but I think for me, he's kind of the, the smallest issue with the film, really. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think, like, obviously his designs, um, I think at the time, whether people knew it or not, you definitely saw a lot of comments that were like, oh, I don't really like why this looks kind of shiny and it doesn't really have that sort of grit from the, the old days. It's not, it doesn't have that fierce, angular vibe to it yeah. um and i think at the time a lot of people just sort of b because i think you know the, the behind the scenes stuff wasn't maybe as widespread uh i think a lot of people just blame that like oh maybe it's just because they do it digitally now i mean i had no idea at the time i think i i don't think i even barely processed any of that when i first saw it but i think what, what strikes me more than anything is more the compositing aspect we're talking you know the 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 way that things are lit the way that the lines are treated um even down to the color design I think that to me is where this film really struggles and you and especially when you compare it to something like Film Z which like you said it's using you know it has has more sort of organic inky lines there are some really great lighting effects going on there and I think that comes down to you know a director like Hosoda just not quite having that same creative vision that someone like Nagamine has um you know, you see a lot of edits all the time of of things from Battle of Gods where it's like, oh, here's a Yamamura shot. Wait, maybe we just sort of change the color design up a bit, slightly alter some of the lines. Oh, it looks pretty cool now. You know, like there, mm -hmm. you can you can definitely, I think, mask some of those questionable designs um, with with a solid uh, director with a good vision. Um, and again, that's what ties me back to why Hosoda, because I think when I when I think back to Dragon Ball, at least the, the big director who I thought was fantastic, is Yoshihiro uh, Ueda. And he was the person who directed the 2008 um, Yosan Goku special, which I think we all kind of love. And a lot of people, um, I, I think you often find a sort of split between people who love Battle of Gods and people who love the 2008 special because they both kind of have that reunion vibe to them. And I think when you look at that special, you can see 
even though it's just a special and it doesn't have the animation heights that something like Battle of Gods has, I think visually a lot of people are more interested in it because it has that cool color work. Like when the screen turns blue or red or like the art style completely changes when Gotenks shows up and it's all inky and, and cartoony. You know, there is, there's some really interesting ideas there. And I think had Battle of Gods had someone like that, I think it could have overcome those shortcomings in the design front and uh, on the staff front. The thing you mentioned about the just the compositing and the lighting reminded me of a scene towards the very, very end of the movie. I believe it's Vegeta, Goku, and Piccolo against some kind of background. I don't know if it's meant to be like a starry night. I can't tell which is part of the problem. But the actual problem is that it looks like a bad Marvel CG, <laughs> like a uh, green screen background. It looks like these characters are green screened and it's animation. Like that shouldn't be a problem. And yet that's exactly what it looks like. <clears throat> it definitely, that was definitely one of the things that struck me the most rewatching this was how much the composite in this film is fighting against itself. Mm. Um, like you definitely have, I've always been a big proponent of the argument that the the color design for Battle of Gods and basically everything go forward was an even bigger problem than the character designs. But then you watch this movie and you catch stuff like digital zooms yeah. everywhere uh -huh. where you're you're you know you're looking at this zoomed in subject and instead of animating that subject close up and then pulling out <laughs> for the wide shot we're just digitally zooming in on this pixelated mess or i mean you even have things trying to kind of mask what was probably maybe a bo boring storyboard with things like uh the alternating frame blur effect with the super saiyan aura mm -hmm. There's just so many composite elements in this movie that are working against each other and seemingly trying to compensate for other flaws, but they all just end up a strange cacophony of a digital effort that is strange to see. One of those zooms, and it's one of the worst moments in the film by far, just for how inappropriate and random it is it's the zoom in on one of the special guest stars i think she was the judo champion <laughs> oh jeez. Mm, yeah, yeah. it's it's <laughs> just so awkward and that that's probably the worst offender like if you didn't know that the the dude at the food stand was i think a fuji tv representative or something like that like it wouldn't really matter and that's fine but that one was just so bad and then there's a farmer where you can't tell is that supposed to be senbei or like are they trying to tell you that that's senbei norimaki but that doesn't make any sense but it looks exactly like him that's not really a zoom thing that's just a bad extra moment <laughs> to that film there there are things like that um, just shoved right on in yeah there. yeah just Oh, not so good. As much as I love the movie, there's a lot of stuff that's not so good about it. Uh, yeah. Speaking of things that are not so good, uh, Tyson, I want you to tell me about the music. So this... <laughs> what a transition. <laughs> this was uh, Dragon Ball fandom's introduction to Norihito Sumitomo, uh, which was not a name I was familiar with, and I tried looking them up, and I'm not sure if it's the same person or someone with a different name, but there is a Norihito Sumitomo that seemed to do a lot of J-dramas. Uh, I'm not sure if it's him. Probably was. I have not been a fan of Sumitomo over the last <laughs> decade. Battle of Gods was the debut, and then we got the real bad Kai Final Chapters stuff, and, you know, got uh. to transition into Resurrection F and onto Dragon Ball Super, and, you know, we can all talk about that Goku arrival scene until the cows come home, but, you know, I'll grant you <laughs> Tournament of Power, different kind of stuff. Um, Rewatching this movie last night, it was interesting because I think the only track that stood out to me was the only one I remembered, and that was just the Happy Capsule Corporation, or just like the birthday party is starting music. Yep. yep. Um, nothing else resonated with me. I couldn't tell you a single thing about the score of this film. And I've been on record for years now like the, the sound of kikuchi is dragon ball to me i think if you don't mm -hmm. um get the spirit of that anywhere it's it's not dragon ball to me it's it's what it is which is twilight years sequel dragon ball battle of gods was a little different because they tried to tell us it was real dragon ball z which you know a whole nother conversation um tyson why is sumitomo good actually it's so very strange watching this movie with Sumitomo in mind mm. because I think he is actually like a microcosm of the behind the scenes approach to this movie in general because with him and with a lot of the other creative choices that are made here it seems clear that whether it's in an effort to compensate for 
not an entirely rock steady production schedule or just in an effort to make an impression. There's a lot of creative decisions made here that are trying to scream as loud as they can. This is a new era of Dragon Ball. This is a, there's a new vibe happening here. And you very much see that with Sumitomo coming on board here. Um, he wasn't even an anime guy beforehand. Mm-hmm. That the, the person that you looked up is, in fact, the Norihito Sumitomo that we all know and love. Okay. Well, some of us love. <laughs> uh, and yeah, he did a lot of J dramas, TV dramas, uh, movies, a lot of uh, it's even some like play adaptation stuff. Uh, that was kind of his wheelhouse before, and he gets brought on to this movie, and especially with the hindsight of not only his previous works, but what he ended up kind of gravitating towards the longer he stuck with Dragon Ball, it's funny seeing how much of a like uh, a feeling out identity crisis is happening here with his work on the film, where he's used to doing these very uh, dramatic affairs. And he gets slapped on this movie that's like, hey, this is a cartoon for kids. Mm -hmm. Write for it. Yeah. And so much of what you hear from it is uncharacteristic of what he did before. And then, of course, what he ended up doing later. The only things in this entire film that sounds like Sumitomo, I would say, are that that one track that you mentioned, the, the little happy guitar track. Uh, there's the track when they finally do the Super Saiyan God ritual. Uh, that sounds like him. And then there's my personal favorite of the entire movie. Really, the only thing that I remember is the uh, there's the solo like grand piano track that plays when they're floating up above. Oh, Earth that's a tremendous Goku track. Okay, sure, it's sure. wonderful. And those three tracks are really the only thing that sound anything like him. And the rest. To me, sounds very much like he's in a studio trying to figure out what to make of this property. How do I drag him off? He's getting yeah, <laughs> and the notes that he's getting back are: this is the new tone. This is made for kids. We're going for a very uh, bouncy vibe. Make of that what you will. It's very strange and understated because other than those three tracks, I'm right there with you. I there wasn't anything that made any of an impression on me on rewatch even as a fan yeah that's what really caught me off guard in my rewatch like i i remember watching that film when it first came out and i was really captivated by that music uh which is weird to think about um like i that that god ritual you spoke about that track wow, i used to love that and i love that piano one you mentioned a lot of the big sort of battle stuff in that climax is the music that i really love and when I was rewatching it, I was so taken aback by how sparse that soundtrack is. That movie uses yeah. a lot of silence, mm-hmm. which is a bold choice, but I th- and, and it can work. But I think it's a detriment in this film. Um, I think a lot of stuff ends up falling flat because it doesn't have this big soundtrack. And I think, and I and, and I don't know if this is a direction thing uh, or if it's again, like you say, Sumi Sumi Tomo trying to you know sort of feel out things a little. Um, but when tracks do pop up, they're so quick and, and it's almost like yeah. there's almost sometimes no natural lead and it just kind of just begins and it ends. It's like, okay, that was, that was a track. Sure. Um, it's really odd. You know, it's, it's been beautiful out here lately. So I, when I was watching the movie last night, we had like the sliding doors open so we could get some fresh air. And I was thinking like, I'm not hearing any music because it's just, you know, I got the windows open. So it's, it's affecting the volume and I kept turning it up and turning it up. And I'm like, I guess I should turn it back down. It's a little too loud now. Subwoofer is like shaking the entire neighborhood. Like, Where's the music? Where's the music? No. Oh no, th- th- there is music. It's just not playing that often. Um, and I guess the only other comment I have there is like it's supposed to be a 5.1 track, but there didn't sound like anything going on behind me. I don't know what kind of mix this was, but it seemed uh, pretty stereo. And I know like the TV, the extended TV version is stereo only. I specifically wanted to watch the theatrical version. I'm like, oh, good benefit 5.1. Now nah, there's, there's nothing going on there. The entire mix for this movie is very strange. There, there's a lot of weird stuff going on, especially with the fight scenes. Yeah, I mean, a <sighs> Rai. <laughs> Bless his soul is not what he was, you know. Uh, I guess. Well, that is one thing I'll say is that, oh, it was especially coming off of things like Super. It was nice to go back and like, oh, OK, this sounds right, at least. Yeah, that's it, this is conflicting. Yeah, it is conflicting. I was going to say that, like, 
I think we, we, when Super first started and we got the new person, I think we were all like, this is bad because the sound effects he was using were bad. And I think with some of the recent movies, now the sound library is good. And we're like, oh, and now the mix is actually pretty fucking sick. And so when I then go back to the older stuff um, and I'm like, okay, that's really familiar. I love this, but it really stands out how not good Rai is these days. And especially when you watch modern One Piece now, it is just a disaster. Um, He's really, really not great. And so I think when I go back to Battle of Gods and it's a film, like we're saying, relies so much on silence, that lack of nuanced sound design really stands out to me. Um, there's a lot of just missing uh, ambient tracks that you, you would expect, uh, or ambient sound effects, I should say. Um, yeah, it's, it's just, it doesn't quite work for what they were going for, um, the way he approaches yeah. sound design, unfortunately. Yeah, the, especially the entire first half of the movie, which is largely the, the quiet part, like you were talking about. There's a very distinct lack of foley for a lot of things, you know, like little <laughs> quiet sounds as things happen. And the sound effects that do happen, they're all, they're all mixed like a, like a TV episode, like a, a <laughs> yeah. weekly TV episode. They're very flat. There's not a lot of panning happening. There is not a lot of lead in and out from soundtrack to soundtrack. It's just, uh, it's, it's strange to hear because going back and revisiting this, you do kind of get that effect of like, Oh, we're back in the Arai sound effect library. That's what the Kamehameha sounds like. That's what a mm -hmm. strong punch sounds like. But then you get distracted because it doesn't sound like you quite remember. And it's not just rose tinted glasses. It's just that it's not mixed incredibly. Yeah. It was definitely a lot better back then. Um, but I think like, and, and, and not to drag this back to the animation stuff again, since we've, we've covered that, but I think it, it definitely, I think that definitely affects almost everything in the, in this film where like you see these names that should be really kicking it out of the park. Like, you know, you, there's Yuya Takahashi on there. There's Hiromi Ishigami, Takaki Yamashita. Like there are some really big names on this film and they're just not hitting as they should. And like, it's the same for Sumitomo. You know, this is someone who, regardless of how you feel about him, you know, he's an, he's an accomplished composer who has since gone on to obviously, you know, really capture a lot of people um, and, and had done prior to this. Uh, again, not hitting quite the same. Uh, and, it, and it just makes me wonder, you know, what is the cause of this? Is it, is it, is it poor direction? Is it a poor schedule? Is it a combination of everything? Yeah, it's, it's, it's curious. I wonder if it was just a lot of hesitancy on their part, especially knowing more about the behind the scenes where Toriyama was not originally involved. And the, the fact that they got that opportunity to market it by Toriyama, effectively, the same way they, they could say by Oda, um, probably came, I mean, it didn't come so late that, you know, the, the movie was already animated or anything. Obviously, they, you know, took Toriyama's script before they started working on the movie. Yeah. Um, but I, I do wonder how much that played into, like, All right, let's let's take it easy this time, guys. Like, we don't know if this is going to take off or anything. We get, oh. uh, I do want to transition into something that absolutely knocked my socks off on rewatch. And that was the script. That was yes. the writing. It was, it was the characters. Uh, I could not believe how real of Dragon Ball this was, especially after the TV series just completely destroyed my interest in modern Dragon Ball. <laughs> like, that's Goku. That is absolutely Toriyama's Goku and Toriyama's every other character as well. I I mean, I the best example is Goku's dissatisfaction with the way that he gets Super Saiyan God. I mean, that is... That is just Goku through and through. And the other line that I can't remember if I noticed before, but absolutely struck me as Toriyama writing. There's a really, it, this is a good direction thing where Goku and Beerus are, I think it's when they're down below and they're just talking and there's like a one second cutaway to Piccolo and he like winces or something. And they, they keep talking and someone's like, Hey, I wonder what they're doing down there. And Piccolo says, it's almost like Goku's getting training. Like, holy shit. Like that, that's, that's the Toriyama attention to detail and what's going on. Like Beerus already has decided what he's going to do the entire rest of the movie at this point. And you just don't know it as an audience member. Piccolo's starting to pick up on it. That kind of stuff absolutely blew me away on rewatch. Yeah, that script is just madness. Like it's so funny because we've just spoken for so long about the shortcomings of this film. And yet 
it's still my favorite Dragon Ball film because yeah. that script is 11 out of 10 perfection from Toriyama. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, yeah, there's almost, there's almost no amount of failings and flaws you can find in the auxiliary elements of this movie that can bring down how tight that script is, how how tight the plotting of everything is. Mm-hmm. It just feels like Dragon Ball, and more importantly, it is massively entertaining. Even the stuff that I think a lot of people point to is, oh, I didn't really love the Pilaf gang, that stuff. Rewatching it last night, I'm like, no, that was so tight and it was so funny. The, oh, we're friends of the young boy who lives here. And Trunks is like, you're my friends? I forget exactly what his line is, but his reaction there was amazing. Like, oh, the funny little monkey and the dog. Oh, dude, the <laughs> monkey line kills me every time. That stuff, it's so good. And what, Oh, the the ending of that scene where Trunks starts doing the fake like, oh, yeah, she's my girlfriend. And Goten just goes like, awesome. And Trunks says something. Again. And then you get like a little further away from the microphone. Goten going, awesome. That's <laughs> 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 so fucking funny to me. The, the peel off stuff in particular was something that I was not looking forward to upon rewatch because I remembered kind of largely feeling not super hot on it when I initially watched. But... The thing with that section is, and it's really something that's missing from a lot of the modern outings, is that it's extremely fucking funny. Yeah, yeah. Like, you can have those elements, those sections of the script, only if you're writing jokes that land. And a lot of times that doesn't happen nowadays. But I I mean, I don't know how much meddling there was in there with Toriyama with those jokes or whether the just that everything was on point, but they do land that entire thing is funny back to back. It's like reading original Dragon Ball again, Mm -hmm. but in animation form and with the jokes paced for a moving image. We have gotten this far. We actually haven't talked about Beerus and Weiss at all, (laughs) which I think is really funny (laughs) because they've become this isn't a typical common complaint about Dragon Ball these days is that every character has become a flanderized version of themselves. Uh, It's wild to go back to like the raw beginnings of Beerus and Whis, and especially because of I forget, was it was it the Broly movie? No, it was Superhero. Um, Morita's performance of Whis was just like wrong and off. Yeah. And just <laughs> like what happened that day? Uh, so to come back to the the original here and hear them, Yamadera is just, I mean, I don't know what else you can say about that dude. He's just an incredible performer. There's so much you could say comparing the different versions of this story. I think Beerus's introduction here is so much better than the TV series where he's already kind of like out and about, like destroying planets and people and stuff like this is so singularly focused on goku i love that part i i would almost go so far as to say that despite how great the characterization was for everyone in this movie beerus in particular but also beerus and Weiss as a pair being so immediately fully realized as characters Uh is a big reason why this movie is great like it doesn't take but 30 seconds after they're introduced and you have you immediately know not only what is going on with these characters but they already have so many little wrinkles and nuances to them you get the, you know the dynamics with and just the craziness with having Beerus being woken up by time bombs and yes, then the, yes. the back and forth with him kind of like joking that he'll he'll erase Weiss but then later it's like oh actually he's your teacher and the the Complete love of food and the fact that he's so polite to Bulma and oh, there's just so much happening here that is not what you get a lot now. There's just so many wrinkles to these characters that are fully realized. It's just a it's a joy to watch. Yeah, that dynamic especially is what really gets me. Like just within seconds, it's like okay, here's the straight lace dude, right? Fine, and then the cat thing does the like the Looney Tunes thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like walking off the rock and then falling off a second later, like. It's so, it's just instant, immediately, you know what those characters are. And it's, I think for that to, to kick off the film almost is just, yeah, perfect. This is like the the pinnacle of anytime there's a new thing coming out and we get script by Toriyama. Like, this is what we keep going back to is like, this is the reason why we're excited when that is the case, because if it's going to hit, it can it can be like this, which is crazy. Even if it's, you know, by committee, by design kind of creation, Toriyama has the potential to do something like this in the script, which elevates every other element of the film. And it's wild that that can happen, but that's the kind of writer and author 
uh, and, and world owner that he is. We talked a lot about this movie already. I put out a tweet yesterday. I want to run through a, a bunch of these. We have a lot of responses from folks I think might open up a, a couple more discussion points. The number one thing that a million people said uh, was, how the fuck was this 10 years ago? Which I completely agree with. All right. So to real comments, uh, Igor says, Lamau, it's the only thing made as good as the original 42 volumes manga. And I think I have to agree. Battle of Gods as the film, not the manga version, not the TV version. This film absolutely feels like it's in line with and at the level of the original manga. Yeah, it definitely. Like it, it just, it slots in there so naturally. Um, and I think like one of the, the most exciting parts about it is that it opened up a world that finale revealing the different mm-hmm. universes and the strength like i think that's such a that's a really interesting way to expand dragon ball and while i don't think that that was capitalized on properly i think as a you know as a, as a starting off point you, you don't get better than that 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 in particular was probably one of the funniest and strangest things rewatching this movie 10 years later for me yeah right is how absolutely flawless it is as a kickoff to a new era yeah it sets up so many new elements ripe for exploration looking back it's just crazy how much that immediately was followed up with nothing (laughs) whether you know whether it be immediately following up with a movie about an old villain and then another movie about an old villain or stuff like the anime uh, going back and saying, you know, there's only a few planets in the entire uh, universe versus this movie that's like, oh, yeah, there's 4,000 green inhabited planets alone. There's just this movie sets up so much. And it's funny looking back and seeing that mastercraft of a script followed up with nada. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of, a uh, friend of the show, Raccoon Bob says, I do think this is one of the better DBZ movies. When it came out, I had so much hope for where Dragon Ball might go, but it seems they didn't explore it as much as I hoped and even put the God form on the side in the very next movie. Yeah, that's the thing. And again, something we've talked about so many times over the years was, all right, uh, let's do a new movie. Let's do a movie next. Okay, yeah, this like this is a good idea, Tori Hammes. Let's, let's do this. Oh, no. Oh, no, we're going to do a TV series. Like it wasn't necessarily planned as the jumping off point. They were making it up as they went, which is what Toriyama did in the original manga the whole time. But that's on a different scale when you're talking about theatrical films and then like a sequel series decades removed. Uh, also, a friend of the show, Randall here says, Sumitomo thankfully came into his own over time. Yamamoro definitely the opposite. While the God form and fight were overall pretty nice, the Gang's All Back vibe doesn't hit as well as the 2008 special did. I loved it back in 2013 because I was desperate for new Dragon Ball. I still like it, but yeah, the, the desperate for new Dragon Ball, I don't know. It, this is one of those things that I'm also going to pull age and rank on where it's like, I wasn't necessarily desperate for new Dragon Ball. You know, we thought Konzenshi was going to be like, we're going to ride off into the sunset and do all the old stuff and not so much. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's definitely funny um, looking back on it because I think one one issue that I have with it, um, there, like we said, there are, so, there are so many parts that absolutely land and they landed so well back when they first came out. But those amazing gags, such as, you know, Goku's whole death thing when when not knowing how to greet people <laughs> properly. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Or or, you know, um or all the Pilaf stuff then was taken and done to death a million times in the T V series to the point of being tired by it. And it's mm-hmm. the same thing with some of those um some of those like Beerus and Weiss gags, they've been done so much at this point that going back, sometimes I find mutes it a little bit, which is not, it's not the fault of the film. Um, but I think it does then, because obviously we've spoken about how the script is what carries it. When you then have some aspect of it muted, I think it, it lessens it a little bit. So I definitely, I definitely get where they're coming from. And I, and I so agree that when you go back to that that 2008 special, which, you know, is both really funny and charming and also really well directed, uh, you know, that there's there's two things working in tandem that, that, that definitely elevates it for me personally. Yeah, the, the whole movie is like one big set of foreshadowing for where this entire community would go for the next 10 years and, and the people that work behind it. I mean, obviously, we talked about some of the negative elements, like seeing Yamamura's work on this and being like, well, okay, and then it continues to evolve so to speak 
Uh, but, you know, you also get these sneak peeks into good things are coming, whether it be some of the standout staff that worked on the film, whether it be the the parts of Sumitomo's score that were allowed to shine, whether it be Beerus and Wee's immediately making an impression. Like, there's a reason that they are mainstays for the franchise now. Yeah. You just get all these echoes of the future both good and bad. And it's very novel to look back on. We got so many comments. Uh, I had pasted a ton into the outline here. I don't think we can get through them all. So forgive me, folks. I did read everything. Uh, I'm going to skip around a little bit here. Uh, Green Shell says, I actually watched it uh, this past Goku Day. Still up there as my top three Dragon Ball movies. I love how it's incredibly tense in one moment and then incredibly stupid in the next. And I think like that's true, but it's also selling it short of just how high those two specific highs are within Toriyama's script. Like his Toriyama's stupid is belly bursting hilarious. The <laughs> the the bit where Trunks flies a whopping three feet in the air to go talk to Shilop <laughs> will never not make me out loud laugh. Oh, uh, dude, Chiba's <laughs> delivery on his reaction to his peel off is phenomenal. <laughs> Uh, let's see more and more, more. Ian says, uh, probably a friend of the site, a uh, friend of the podcast, probably the best Dragon Ball movie on the writing front. While I maybe think superhero is most fun working equally well as both epilogue and kickoff. However, while up to theatrical standards, it suffers visually under some dull directing and Yamamuro's designs among the worst looking. And then Ian agrees with the earlier comment about this standing, uh, alongside the original 42 volumes. Yeah. Uh, we, we mentioned some of that stuff here. Uh, cyber size says, there are kids watching this today who don't remember a time before Beerus Weiss existed or Super Saiyan God. Stop saying these things. I don't <laughs> like what you're saying. I mean, it's it's hard to accept, but the truth of the matter is this did kick off an entire new generation of fans. Sure did, yeah. Where this is their default. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Th this is what they know. And of course, they've seen Dragon Ball Z, quote unquote. They, some of them have seen Dragon Ball. But this is this is their default place. And it's insane to think about. Yeah, I have to remind myself of that a lot of the time when I like see comments on Twitter and I'm like, that's a really weird thing to say. And then you click through <laughs> to their profile and it's like, you know, 16 years old. I'm like, right, right, like, right. I, I'm going to just leave you to that. We, we have nothing in common. <laughs> <laughs> I, I make all these comments and it, it sounds like I'm, I'm down on it, but I am of the firm belief that you, you need constant fresh blood in a fandom for it to survive long term and not just be, you know, people like me saying the same things over and over and over, which I will continue to do. But I do uh, <laughs> want all the new people, uh, the new blood coming in. That's, that's oh, absolutely no gatekeeping here. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Um, Jake soul says, I kind of hate that it's not canon anymore. Beerus destroying some rock and saying he'll destroy the rest of earth. Some other time is like one of the best character moments I've seen of him way better than whatever he does in both super versions. I M O. And if I remember Jake put up some screenshots, like the TV series, Beerus is just like sleeping in midair. Uh, that's again, that is the Toriyama thing. Like I technically destroyed a piece of the earth. Yeah. I did exactly what I said I was going to do. That's great. Yeah. It's a weird. This is where it does get kind of awkward because it's like, man, there are so many different continuities, canons, whatever you want to call them now, and you kind of just have to like pick and choose what you love and try and make sense of everything. But I suppose in many ways, it's kind of always been like that, hasn't it? Uh, last Twitter comment here from Hunter02. Never understood the love for Sumitomo. His OST is just kind of there. Not particularly good or bad. Animation, typical modern Yamamura crap on a higher budget. I think that speaks to what we were talking about earlier, where you know, it's his debut work and they're, they're feeling it out. He doesn't quite know what to do here for his music. It was just there throughout the film. All right. Listen here, Hunter02. I have <laughs> your address right here. <laughs> I will not hesitate to bring down the wrath of God upon you. Sumitomo went through a rough time in Dragon Ball. He was he's figuring stuff out, and then he got shoved onto Kai with 12 seconds of notice, and then right straight into... Look, you gotta, you gotta give him a break. I forgave him for his, uh, his transgressions with the Broly soundtrack. Have you opened it yet, yeah. Mike? 
No, of course not. Uh, so uh, we have additional <laughs> comments here. I want to highlight a few from our Patreon chat on Discord. Uh, thank you to all the folks who support the site. Uh, these are a little bit longer because they didn't have to fit in a tweet, which is a benefit, I think, to some of these. Uh, Silby says, I still super appreciate this film just for how cohesive it feels compared to almost anything else released later on. It expands the Dragon World in a way that ignites imagination without being ham-fisted or fan servicey. has character moments that are really compelling and not carried through anywhere else, like we mentioned Goku's dissatisfaction with the god power, and really balances its comedic and action tones well. And even though it does all that world and character expansion, I still feel very nice closure with how it ends. Truly think it still has something to offer for every type of fan as a result, and is my most rewatched film. Some highlights for me are Beerus' wake-up scene, mentioned that, Beerus versus Goku fight once Hero Song of Hope starts playing, we didn't even mention the flow songs, the Sumitomo score where Beerus and Goku are talking in space, we did mention that, and Beerus and Oolong's Junkin fight even though it's only in the extended version um one other thing i want to say about oolong and this is now mike talking again now uh the very very end where goku is talking with i think it's vegeta bulma and piccolo and oolong like runs in and jumps on goku's head i'm like oh yeah get me an og gang member here in here alongside that that's just great that hero song is is great i will defend that until my dying breath that it's is a banger. such a hype moment the only problem is this forced insertion of the english version even in the japanese language track yeah the yeah I, home video releases. yeah i completely jump scared myself when i was <laughs> watching it the other <laughs> month because i i i've ripped so many different versions that i own yeah, onto my yeah, pc yeah. and labeled none of them properly and so <laughs> that english version came in and i was like what the fuck <laughs> incomprehensible uh all right smug stick says battle of gods is definitely my most rewatched movie ever it felt like a real celebration of dragon ball it was so self-contained and gave us so much hope for the future and wonder despite some disappointment since then i'm so glad it brought back uh dragon ball the way it did i remember begging my parents to drive me and my best friend to see it an hour away i even cosplayed it and only 14 years old i can't believe it's been so long god yeah, that makes me feel old. The excitement was real. I mean, it was. AJ hates going to movie theaters because he's antisocial. But no, I the remember the, the, worst. the the theater experience here, even with you know, kind of some of the cringiness of American Dragon Ball fans and TFS jokes being thrown around and all that. The energy in the audience watching this was incredible. And you've got huge laughs erupting, people cheering when big moments happen. It was, it, even if the final product was not necessarily flawless, it was a, absolutely a cultural event. There is something to be said for being in an audience with dub fans when Vegeta things happen. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, so, <laughs> I, I don't think I, I don't, I don't think I saw Battle of Gods in cinemas. I don't know if it didn't get a UK release or I just didn't go because I'd seen it. Uh, but yeah, I so agree because I, I saw, I saw Resurrection F in cinemas twice. I saw it once in Tokyo when it came out and then I yeah. saw it ag again uh, in <laughs> the, like, the shittiest theatre, like in the middle of England and it was packed to the brim with anime fans and they were screaming and that Vegeta moment was <laughs> mental and like... It's not even my, my dub of choice, and yet it's still the most exciting that film has been for me just because of how mental fans are. A hundred percent. I mean, I, I've i seen, like, backyard, hardcore amateur wrestling, and I've seen Resurrection F in theaters. And I'll give you a guess as to which had a bigger reaction between that and <laughs> Vegeta's moment in Resurrection A hundred percent. Yep, yep, yep. All right, a couple more here from our Patreon Discord. Uh, friend of the site, friend of the podcast, friend of the wiki, uh, Lunar Jake says, this might be a sobering comment, and please no more, but my levels of excitement for the future of Dragon Ball began with this movie and ended a few episodes into Dragon Ball Super. From 2013 to 2015, the idea of Z continuing with movies and possibly getting into online content, that being Dragon Ball Online's universe dabbling with the relatively unknown MMO, really resonated with me. Even if Battle of Gods was a story set before the 28th Tenkaichi Budokai, I still had high hopes for where the series could go beyond that. The idea of the original cast, mostly, reprising their roles to guide us into a new generation of Dragon Ball stories was electrifying. Instead of whatever new transformations or power-ups we'd see, I was way more excited over the expansions of the world. New God Hierarchy? Divine Key? Universe teases? Toriyama's involvement still actually meant something. All this to say that I oversold the future to myself. It was a great time to be an older fan 
and I look back on it fondly. Definitely never imagined that after 10 years, we would effectively still be exactly where Z ended, just with more Broly somehow. <laughs> yeah, we got, you had one Broly before, you want another Broly? We got three Brolys. <laughs> Yeah, I definitely yeah, relate to that. with a green thing. I had so many ideas in my head just based on those universe teasers alone. I mm-hmm. just remember thinking like, man, you can go anywhere. You can conjure yeah. up yeah. anything now. Like it's that excitement that I think captured so many of us with the start of Z where Raditz shows up and it's like, hey, other planet stuff. And suddenly you're whisked off to Namek. Like that's, that's hype as hell. And mm-hmm. that, that could have been what this was. And I don't want to be a massive downer about it because there are a lot of things that I have enjoyed from the modern content, but... Yeah, more ah, is great. Yeah, I had a great time with that. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, like for all its flaws, I still had a great time with the Goku Black arc in, <laughs> in spite of all of those very big flaws. Yeah, it just, but no, nothing has ever been what I thought we were promised, which was new adventures and new places. And it was always tournament, tournament. <laughs> Well, I got one last comment from our Discord. This is from Inton Yon. I hope I'm pronouncing it even remotely accurately. I definitely have to say, seeing it with friends in theaters and hearing Chala Hechala for an American dub of the show was gratifying. Lol. Yes. Even though we got the <laughs> incomprehensible English version of Flo's songs, having Hechala was uh, something else. Yeah. I, if folks don't remember back then in America, we were getting dub only showings despite other Funimation properties getting alternate <laughs> subtitled showings. And it took us until superhero under the new Crunchyroll regime to get subtitled showings for things. And now things are exactly the opposite where people are complaining that there's too much Chala head Chala. How the times change. Well, gentlemen, we are 10 years removed from battle of gods. There's a lot to say about it. We said, a lot about it. We said a lot of negative stuff about it, but I do at least personally want to bring things back around to that goddamn script for this movie from Toriyama. I don't know what this Yusuke Watanabe guy had written before. I mean, we kind of know it was, you know, between him and Yamamoro, it was a lizard infecting the science with evil and bulky caped super Saiyan God. Thank God. Thank you, Toriyama. Um, (laughs) But, but not even just like, the surface level plot points. It's the moment to moment character beats and little lines of dialogue, little reactions, little snide remarks to each other, the way they play off of each other. It felt exactly as we've mentioned multiple times, like the original series. And it still feels like a perfect extension um, mid quill really <laughs> to the original series, much like we've had everything else in, in this exact same time. I still think back to how perfectly it was a, someone else mentioned this, a, a great epilogue to the series, even though there obviously is the 28th Badoka, if you want to consider that an epilogue. But the way that Battle of Gods still actually kind of works, even with GT, like the the fact that, and they've destroyed this ever since, but the fact that Goku absorbs the power of Super Saiyan God into himself, that's like a plot point during the movie, which then Toriyama and Toriyotaro have to sort of walk back and completely reconcile, but not at all throughout the entire rest of what Dragon Ball Super becomes. That stuff in here works so well. I love it. Um, And then we got more Super. But anyway, AJ, your 10 years removed final, which won't be final because we'll talk about it in another 10 years. uh, Thoughts on Battle of Gods? Yeah, I mean, like you said, we, we definitely spent a lot of time criticizing the aspects of it. But I think we did all that to then go, it doesn't matter because everything else is so good. That script is just the embodiment of joy and sort of that that Dragon Ball optimism and fun. There have been, like, I am known as the animation person. Dragon Ball Super Broly came out and it's like one of the most wonderfully animated things ever. And like, in spite of that, still didn't overtake Battle of Gods for me because it doesn't have everything that makes this so special, which, as we've said, is is that Toriyama touch that is so so distinctive and so recognizable. Um, I, I yeah, I just I adore everything about that. Tyson, Battle of Gods, ten years. Battle of Gods is magic. It's a magic that I think everybody is waiting to be recaptured, and it has not been done yet. But I hope it will. What would it take? I mean, that's the if we knew the, then several yeah. <laughs> several hundred million dollar question. If you knew, Toy would have uh, some words to say with you. My answer to that is. Uh, more of the first 
70% of Dragon Ball Superhero, less of the final 30% of Dragon Ball yeah. Superhero. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, that brings our topic to a close. Before we say goodbye to folks, I will let them say what they got going on. This is what you do. You say, hey, friends, come on my thing, but then talk about the things that you do too. Uh, AJ, what do you got going on these days? I'm still a slave to Totally Not Mark, doing sponsorship stuff, sometimes writing script things, uh, still shitposting on Twitter with the occasional informative thread. That's about it, really. I just stick to behind the scenes and let Mark be the shield of criticism and toxicity and scary internet things. <laughs> That's what you do. It. You got to have someone else out in front and or do it for 25 years and then you just are immune to everything. Numb to it. You have to be. <laughs> uh, Tyson, you are the new voice to this podcast. Uh, how about you? What do you do out there? Well, it sounds a little bland now because very much the same that AJ does. I mean, I still, uh, you know, post the informative thread on Twitter every once in a while about the comings and goings of Dragon Ball's music production. But now I live in totally marked land writing scripts and TikTok videos and all sorts of stuff yelling about why Dragon Ball is good or why Dragon Ball is bad. <laughs> Dragon Ball is good, actually. <laughs> yeah, it turns <laughs> out. All right. Well, thank you, folks. I appreciate it. Um, I'm so glad that we got a chance to do this and talk to you both in particular. Uh, I'm excited for the future of Battle of Gods look backs because we'll do it again at some point. It may continue in a future podcast episode coming to your ears soon, just with a different, different angle. So stay tuned for that. Thank you again to AJ and Tyson. That was our look back at Dragon Ball Z Battle of Gods gods. So this is episode 501 of the podcast. You may be asking yourself, hey, you were talking about Battle of Gods, there being like more conversation things and stuff to do. And in fact, that is true. Next, well, at least the plan, <laughs> next time on the podcast, we're going to keep the Battle of Gods gravy train rolling. I don't know why it's a gravy train. Is it a hype train? I don't know. It's some kind of train. And we are going to look at one of the other three versions I guess other two versions, there's three total of Battle of Gods. I don't know, do you want to kind of like video game adaptations? What would, what would like the best video game adaptation of Battle of Gods even be? Like Kakarot's not really it. Battle of Z? And, all right, never mind. You know, <clears throat> we're going to look at the manga version of Battle of Gods. But hey, Mike, uh, hey dummy, you already did that before. In fact, we did. Back in October 2015, after those four chapters, we, we talked all about it. And then we kind of ignored the Dragon Ball Super manga. That was an interesting time for the manga. You certainly know this. This is a, a question that comes up all the time. Hey, I want to read Dragon Ball Super instead of watch it. How do I do that? And it's like, well, there are these four chapters. They don't really cover the movie. And then they skip the next movie. Uh, and even then, it's all a little different. And then it goes into the next thing, the tournament arc. But And then things start being real different from each other. Yeah, we didn't end up doing a full review of the Dragon Ball Super manga contemporary with the TV series. I am committing to you here. We're at least going to reassess the Battle of Gods version of that, and we'll see where the future takes us with a reassessment of the Dragon Ball Super manga. I think that would be a fun thing to consider, huh? Huh? And of course, you may be asking, hey, uh, what about that GT review of Awesomeness? Yeah, I know. Ha haven't forgotten about it. Don't worry. You know, mul Multi-year process here. Sometimes we... Take five years off. You know, we'll come back to it. Six years? Five years? Please don't run those numbers. Uh, anyway, so the the nice thing is that's what you have to look forward to. And there's a lot more to look forward to on the podcast. Uh, and a lot of it's actually already been recorded. I am psyched. I got some things in the backlog here. Uh, I got some other plans coming up. It's a real great time coming back to the podcast after uh, that massive project that was episode 500. I'm ready to roll here. So that all said, www.kanzenshuu. Dot com. That is kanzenshu.com. That is the website that is in your ears right now. Thank you again to AJ. Thank you again to Tyson. Uh, you can check out myself and usually Tyson most Saturday nights at twitch.tv slash EX alongside a lot of other friends and familiar voices from this here podcast. I know we talk about this a lot, but it is kind of like a secret extra podcast most Saturday nights. We're playing Mario Kart, but we're also just talking, 
and shooting the breeze. So come join us again most Saturday nights when you're listening to this now. I might actually not be around this upcoming one, but hey, there's a great archive of stuff to go check out. Uh, and speaking of which, over on the Konzenshu YouTube channel, I occasionally, rarely put up a compilation of if when we're playing on those Saturday nights and there are some extensive Dragon Ball conversations, I cut those out, edit them together, and put them up on our YouTube channel. The most recent one you're going to want to check out if you have not seen it. It was not our look ahead at the Tenkaichi Budokai. It was someone's coverage of the Kenkaichi Budokai. That's all I'll say. Go check it out. Links on the website. Thank you again. I will see y'all next time for 502. Later. Later.